don't have to sing on this song if you don't want to. If you like the idea, though, you can help me out. If you love your Uncle Sam, bring him home. Bring him home. Support our boys in Vietnam. Bring him home. Bring him home. It'll make our general sad, I know. Bring him home. Bring him home. They want to tangle with the foe. Bring him home. Bring him home. Here is their big fallacy. Bring them home, bring them home. They'll have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world's got hunger and ignorance. Bring them home, bring them home. You can't beat that with bombs and guns. Bring them home, bring them home. So if you Sing this song, bring a song, bring a song. Now there's one thing I will confess, bring a song. I'm not really a pacifist, bring a song, bring a song. If an army invaded this land of mine, bring a song. You find me out on the firing line, bring a song. Even if they drop their queens to bomb, bring them home, bring them home. Oh, they brought helicopters and a bomb, bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle Sam, <laughs> support our boys in Vietnam, bring them home, bring them home. Yes, show these generals their palace. They don't have the right weaponry. Bring them home, bring them home. The world needs housing, food, and schools. Bring them home, home, home. And when in a few universal rules, bring them home, bring them home. So if you love your uncle Oh, that's good. Welcome. Very glad that everybody could join us. We expect there will be a bunch more folks coming on, but we don't want to punish the people who are timely by delaying. Um, I'm John McAuliffe. Uh, this is a webinar hosted and produced by the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee, which started in 2014. Um, our objective is to recall and honor the movement that successfully ended the U.S. war in Indochina 49 years ago. We hope that our experience is relevant and useful to current campaigns for peace and social justice. We offer opportunities for folks who are active against the war to share part of their lives to an international audience, both those who were present during the 1960s and 1970s and younger generations. Since COVID, that has largely been done by webinars like this one. This is, I think, the 19th or 20th that we've done. Um, a couple of protocols that provide due respect to our speakers. One is the speaker's bios. You've probably read them already on the blog page. I'm going to try an experiment this time and put as each speaker comes on, I'll put it in the chat. Um, and so each time we try new things with this, um, each speaker will have up to 10 minutes for an initial presentation. And then there will be a discussion, which is moderated by Linda Yar, who is, you will see on the screen now. Um, and then responses to your questions, which you can post at any point 
on the Q and A using the Q and A function, not the chat function. The chat mm -hmm. function is closed until we get to the point of discussion, so that it's not taken attention away from what the speakers are saying. Um, and but when it's open, you can direct your messages to everybody, or you can choose a particular person to chat with um, or one of the speakers. You can actually now chat to one of the speakers if you have something that you want to bring to their attention. Um, if you're a colleague of one of the speakers and you want to add verbally uh, to his or her presentation, send me a text, send me a chat just to me and we'll see if we can get you on to speak. Um, also, we will be sending out probably to, by tomorrow, two things. One is the YouTube video of this whole program um, for you to look at and share with other people. And also a copy of the most relevant stuff from the chat so you don't have to try and write down the key information, um, it'll be available to you. Um, I will also, when you get the notice of that, you'll see a not subtle request for financial help. Um, nobody who does this is paid to do it, but the Zoom company and YouTube, and when we can afford it, promotion does require hard currency. Um, so that's it for the setup. Um, for those of you who were with us two weeks ago when the whole system collapsed, we have a backup with Doug Hostetter as a co-host. So if the gremlins operate, the system won't go down. So thank you very much for coming. Um, Linda, it's all yours. Well, um, thank you. First of all, thank you everyone for um, coming to this rescheduled event. Uh, it's wonderful to, to have this participation from around the world. And I especially want to thank John and acknowledge his leadership in bringing together so many um, incredible webinars that, that, that bring out different uh, groups and, and uh, sections of the, the anti-war movement uh, during and, and remind us of, of those years, they will be a tremendous uh, resource uh, for the future. Uh, the panel assembled today represents critical aspects of the movement to hold the US government accountable uh, for what it was doing in Vietnam and to provide peace activists with the historical grounding and up-to-date analyses of the war as it was unfolding. These representatives uh, with you today of the leading research and education organizations will share their personal experiences about the founding and uh, uh, missions of the organizations, how they came about, what their contributions were to the anti-war movement. Um, you will see uh, their full biographies. I'll just mention that uh, first will be uh, Beverly Goligorsky, who served as editor of Yet Report in collaboration with Carol Brightman. Uh, she's a noted novelist, essayist, uh, scriptwriter, and reviewer, and we are very glad to have her with us today. Second, we'll turn to Martha Winokur. Uh, Martha will speak about the role of the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars. Um, Martha is also currently chair of the board of directors of Critical Asian Studies, which is the journal that succeeded the journal founded by CCAS, namely the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars. Uh, next, uh, Professor David Marr, Emeritus Professor and Visiting Fellow um, at Australian National University. He was co-director of the Indochina Resource Center, which was a source of information and publications, uh, again, to educate the population about what was happening in Vietnam and what Vietnam was all about. Um, Bill Goodfellow, 
also of the Indochina Resource Center and later the Center for International Policy, is a veteran peace activist and director of the Afghanistan Peace Campaign. He was an associate of the IRC and was actually in Vietnam and uh, Cambodia during the, the closing weeks of the, of the, the war. And finally, uh, Leon Tu Packard will uh, tell us about her work with NARMIC. Uh, that was the National Action Research into the Military Industrial Complex Program. It was a project of the American Friends Service Committee. And it drew on a wide range of documents, press articles, and other sources um, to really educate the American public and Congress about the, the war and its cost. Um, so as John said, each speaker will have 10 minutes and then we'll have about 15 minutes of discussion for the whole panel and we'll turn it over to Q&A. So with that, let me invite Beverly to begin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda. I'm happy to be here, happy to talk to you. This is my first webinar on this period of time in the 60s. I became involved in Viet Report. Let me see if you can see this. It's an, it's an old, old issue of Viet Report. Um, in the middle of 1964, Carol Brightman understood, the late Carol Brightman understood in her brilliance that the truth about Vietnam would not come out and that something had to be done to express what seemed possible to happen. And of course it did happen. At any rate, um, I was working at a nursing journal as a typist, very young at the time. And Carol Cena, who was also a worker there, invited me to lunch one September day in 1964 and asked me to join Viet Report staff, which I did. And um, at the thing about the Yet Report was that there weren't many magazines at the time that were doing what this magazine did. It not only expressed the history of Vietnam, it expressed what the intentions of the United States were. It expressed um, what the beginnings of the movement was doing. And it had very, very erudite people writing for it. And little by little, uh, students were writing for it. And it came out monthly. It was a very effective magazine. However, the whole movement and the whole left was changing. We were going from Vietnam to imperialism. And that change from Vietnam to imperialism meant that Viet Report would not be adequate anymore. Although um, we kept going until the end of 1964, until we started Leviathan. Now Leviathan kept going about the war, but it was also about women, racism, and everything else that the movement was um, you know, interested in. The thing about um, Carol Brightman, um, was that her idea was a pioneering idea. Things started after the report, ramparts, et cetera, et cetera. Some glossy, some not glossy. The, 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 the newspapers came out and the left media began to thrive, which meant that the Viet report in and of itself wasn't as needed anymore, which was why we went to Leviathan. It was a wonderful experience and the person who actually organized me into Viet Report is Carol Siener, who's in Oregon. And um, there were just a, an incredible number of important people that passed through the magazine, from Tom Hayden to Staunton Lynn, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if there are questions, I'll be happy to answer them. But I think that's about the explanation for now. Thank you. I can't hear Linda if she's talking. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. No, we can't hear Linda. 
She's on mute. Okay, yeah, she's I, okay. Sorry, I, um, okay. The usual <laughs> thing, you're on mute. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's turn to Martha Winnicker, who will promptly unmute herself. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> uh, the Com Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars was quite different from Viet Report in that we were embedded in universities we were made up overwhelmingly, but not exclusively, of graduate students and, you know, very junior faculty. There were some more senior established figures in the field who were very sympathetic, but in the end were reluctant to align themselves with insurgents. Um, the, the, we were also, um, some of the characteristics of us that, that made us distinctive, I think, our audience was primarily, we wanted to reach a, a wide public, but our real audience was primarily um, in the universities of you know, fellow academics, fellow students. And then we had a great hope, and I think we had a lot of achievement in providing material that people were able to use in teaching about Vietnam and about Asia, people who were not necessarily themselves really experts but we're able to draw on material that we were able to provide. <clears throat> we were made up of people who studied, we were you know, at universities all over the country, this is before the internet, phone calls, cheap, uh, long distance phone calls were also very expensive and you thought five times before you picked up the phone to dial somebody, especially if you had to have an extensive conversation. <laughs> um, and I think that's an important piece about coordinating across geography that you know, was no longer true. But we represented people who studied different countries in Asia, China, more of us were in China than anything else. We had among us scholars of Vietnam, um, a few people who actually specialized in Laos and even I think perhaps Cambodia, um, other parts of Asia, South Asia, Korea, Japan. And we had different language skills and different pers you know, personal direct knowledge from on the ground. CCIS was formed in 1968, March of 1968, at a meeting of the Association for Asian Studies, which is the professional organization for people in that field, in the academic field. It happened roughly a month after the Tet Offensive, which had fairly clearly demonstrated that the American project in Vietnam was uh, not likely to be successful and that continuing it was going to be a lot more bloodshed, a lot more destruction, and a completely un, you know, unpredictable outcome, but not some kind of, you know, a new vert. I saw some, some of the scholars in the field at the time who were leading lights on the sort of other side said, the great model is American reconstruction of Japan after World War II. We made it into this thriving, wonderful capitalist economy. And I think we had the idea that we're gonna make, do something like that in Vietnam. Mm. <laughs> and, um, Obviously, the Tet Offensive began to show that we were not going to do anything like that in Vietnam. So the insurgents brought to the um, brought to the meeting of the Association for Asian Studies a resolution in March 1968 to ask the association to, to call for the cessation of hostilities, or at least bringing the war to some kind of a close. That resolution was not enacted. Uh, the opponents of, uh, argued that it would such a taking such a stand on, by the profession would compromise the objectivity of scholarship and was simply not appropriate. The um, graduate students, I think they were mostly based at Harvard. I haven't fully checked that back. I was a first year graduate student in Berkeley. I was not in Philadelphia. First year graduate students did not travel across the country to attend academic conferences. We barely knew they were happening. <laughs> um, but the, so I think that I think the core group was based at Harvard, and they walked out of the, the meeting, the association meeting, and they formed the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars then and there, um, announcing that their purposes were to both make our knowledge as experts or becoming experts or experts in the making available to the peace movement, and to challenge the fundamental premises of the disciplines and the and the learning that we were doing the frameworks that of Cold War frameworks that made um, in their eyes and our, you know, my eyes now, the profession itself an accomplice to the American government policy and in many cases, a tool thereof. Um, 
in the first years, we we public we we very got got moving very quickly. By May, two months after the founding meeting, the walkout founding meeting, there was a first issue of a CCAS newsletter, stapled together at one corner, mimeographed. <laughs> it's really hard to read, but voila, we have a newsletter. Um, a year and a half later, we have the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars. This is the second issue called that in May 1969, so barely a year, just over a year after this first meeting, the first issue of the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars came out. We were bold in October 1969, a year and a half after this founding meeting. We call this volume two. <laughs> and um, the coverage, the material that was that was contained was in those in the years of well, I need to say two things about it. It was done by volunteers. Nobody was paid. Um, the early issues of the bulletin were edited by rotating group casts of characters. I think it must have been, I'm, I think just from looking at who the names are and what I know about where they were, that, that it moved from campus to campus. A group of people would take on responsibility for putting on an issue. There were two or three or four or five people who sort of rotated the editorship. Um, that, that was, you know, it wasn't a wide group, but there were a bunch of people who showed up and listed inside the front cover as staff. Um, for each, and again, this is not staff as if we didn't have typists, we didn't have any paid people, we had ourselves <laughs> typing. Um, you know, we all had to know how to type, and as a graduate student, you had to know how to run a mimeograph machine, too. <laughs> um, but it was so rotated around, covered things like exposes of federal funding in the Asian studies field, CIA collaboration, the uh, projects at the um, Center for Southeast Asian Studies at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale that was kind of organized around federal <laughs> projects. People did research on things like Thai village customs in order to figure out how best to organize propaganda campaigns to quote win hearts and minds. Um, we published a number of in-depth articles on the peace talks project process who, what the interests were, who was involved, how they were proceeding. Um, we published an analysis of the Lan Nol Khu in Cambodia in 1970, which opened the door eventually to the Khmer Rouge. Um, in depth, I had a long list, but when I was trying to do it in preparation, go through it in the preparation for this webinar, I way overshot the time limit that John gave me to speak. So <laughs> I'm not gonna go through my list of all the articles we published. I will point out that um, all in the bull, the, so the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars as an organization, we worked on mostly on campuses. We had the bulletin, this is a big thing. And then there were campus chapters that did everything from holding uh, teach-ins at their local campus. Some people collaborated with GI support work. There were some international chapters. I was in Tokyo from 1972 to 75. We worked a lot with Japanese peace activists, as well as occasionally organizing letters from Americans resident in Japan to the American embassy to protest things like the Christmas bombing of Hanoi in 1972. But our sort of ongoing day-to-day -day work was as our allies supporting a Japanese publication in English as, Ameri as you know, your free copy editors to help get, but the Jap our Japanese colleagues would say helping to get your vertical writing into horizontal, your vertical <laughs> Japanese writing into horizontal English writing. And we, it was just a kind of inside joke among us all. Uh, the, the organization Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars disbanded in 1979 as um, campus activism around Asia kind of had dissipated into anti-imperialism, pro-feminism, whatever the issues of the day were. We also had some internal debates that are not really relevant here. But uh, the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars continues. We were kept, we were eventually able to hire a full-time editor. Uh, kept alive by an individual donor, which is fortuitous and kept, you know, is, is what made the difference between our having to close down sometime in the late 70s and continuing until 2001, when we became then, we entered into a partnership with commercial publisher Routledge and changed our name to Critical Asian Studies, which is still publishing today. And as, as um, Linda mentioned, I am on the board and temp currently the president thereof. I, I think I'm out of, oh, I'm close to out of town, okay. <laughs> um, and 
I want to say that the entire archive of the Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars is available at no cost, no password, no subscription, no login on the criticalasianstudies.org website. There is, if you go to that website, there is a link to Bulletin of Concerned Asian Scholars. And that contains both the, the tables of contents for every issue and the text of every article. So um, I want to recommend it to anybody that's just, especially for those of our generation who were there. I don't I tear up every time I hear Pete Seeger sing that short, that song. <laughs> um, I, the passion, the, the commitment, the, 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 you know, the, the idea that we were doing something that mattered, that we needed to do something that mattered, that we had, because we were in the academy, we had the privilege of being in the academy, we had access to material that other people didn't have access to, and we could make it available. In the end, we made it more available to other scholars than we, we didn't turn into a popular journal. We had a lot of debates about whether we should, <laughs> um, whether we should like, dispense with footnotes and just write nice things. Mm -hmm. 1970, we published the Indochina study, story, the reader on the whole, the whole situation, you know, how the, the origins of American intervention, the origins of the contending players, um, was put together by a group of 37 graduate students that I think mm. were clustered around Harvard, but not all at Harvard, I'm sure, published by Pantheon. And I'm told, or our, our records say, that the paperback copies sold 58,000 copies. Mm. So we did do some, you know, that was out. That's way bigger than our membership, I can assure you. Um, but we also were multiplied by providing Know, background that people could use is for teaching, for, for interaction with their with their graduate students and with their undergraduates, and for interaction with the world. I mean, teach-ins were certainly, Cornell in the summer of 1969 had a teach-in that drew 750 people. Um, we also, some of us, more in the East than us in the West, engaged in lobbying and, you know, learned about Congress and so forth. But we, we aspired to transform the field of Asian studies. To, we had, a lot of us did not end up staying in the field of Asian studies. I'm one of those who did not make it back. Um, I left graduate school halfway through expecting to return and I never did. Um, one of the things that happened was that the job market kind of fell apart in the middle seventies and the people, the jobs that we were being trained for didn't happen. <laughs> But another thing was a lot of the funding that we had that has supported us to be graduate students was federal funding that was really related to military or you know political or intelligence uh, goals and as I mentioned the village studies about how to how to design uh, propaganda so I'll let it stop there um, I could talk a long time it was an important part of my life. I was not a key player in CCIS, but I've been I've been there since the beginning, and um, I feel it was important to us, and I hope it has been important. I hope it is still important to those who have come after us. And I know some major academic careers came out of CCIS, and also some really important people in publishing who've published some really important material that it's not academic per se, but it's certainly influenced the way anybody thinks about Asia who reads in English. Thank you all. Mm, thank you. Uh, thank you, Martha. I would also encourage people to take a look at criticalasianstudies.org because there's also a whole commentary section of uh, <laughs> opinion pieces and short pieces that are also carry on the spirit of uh, critical Asian studies. So, and uh, Martha has a key role continuing in that effort. Thank you, Martha. Uh, so let's uh, go on to David Marr. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me just, <clears throat> excuse me, let me just mention in CCAS that um, I was there at the same time as Martha in, in Berkeley. And um, there were, there was quite a, I think, almost equal attention to uh, recognition of the People's Republic of China as an issue. And so we had sometimes some lively discussions about which uh, which should take priority. Uh, but that that was part of the the discussion that went on at the time. Um, uh, 
Let me just say just a few things about my activities uh, before the formation of the Indochina Resource Center. Um, um, I was a Marine liaison officer um, uh, in Vietnam in 62, 63, uh, having studied uh, Vietnamese at the, at the um, Army uh, Language Center in Monterey. Um, uh, the, um, I went, um, I went to Vietnam again in, in the summer of 65 um, to research student political activities for my, for my, for my master's thesis uh, at, at Berkeley. Um, um, we re we uh, returned again for eight months in 67, uh, mainly to research my PhD dissertation on the early 20th century uh, anti-colonial movements. Um, uh, that became my, my, my book, uh, Vietnamese Anti-Colonialism. Um, um, in, in September of 67, I, I marched um, uh, in with Vietnamese students uh, in an anti-war uh, demonstration um, in Saigon, carrying a sign, uh, U.S. students also uh, demand peace now. Um, and uh, I was lucky not to be arrested. Um, and we, deport we uh, departed the country hastily uh, three, day three days later. Uh, I was banned from returning to South Vietnam for the duration of the war. Um, I should point out, of course, that many Vietnamese students in that demonstration were later jailed or put or, or, or um, arrested. Um, so I, I was lucky in that respect. Um, uh, back at Berkeley, um, I talked at the uh, first uh, uh, teach-in. I think it was in '69, but um, Martha might correct me on that. Um, uh, with uh, Professor Franz Sherman uh, at the UC Berkeley. Um, uh, I went to a Stockholm Peace Conference um, in, in, I think, 69, which was my first chance actually to meet a, a, uh, a VC official, uh, someone from the other side and have a serious discussion. That was very rewarding. Um, uh, back in Berkeley, I, um, yeah, I uh, continued, um, it, well, in, in 69, Professor K. Uh, N. George K. N. Uh, invited me to Cornell, uh, and um, at that um, he he subsequently also provided a lot of introductions to people in in Washington, um, uh, and he and he testified in in, in some uh, congressional committees. Um, uh, Cornell Weiss was uh, vital in our initial seed money. Uh, to set up the uh, Indochina Resource Center um, in, in June of 71. Um, our, our office is located uh, near DuPont Circle, which could get us in touch with a lot of other people. Um, and this happened to be the moment when the uh, New York Times began publishing the Pentagon papers, uh, which uh, gave, gave our effort a real news. Uh, Don Lewis is a project in the SEC, and much of the time he was on the road uh, with his very effective uh, Indo China mobile education project. Um, uh, he, he would send us uh, contact addresses um, to receive the uh, monthly uh, Indo China Chronicle, and we, uh, we would send Don current uh, information and images that we received uh, from Vietnam. Uh, the, the IRC staff at that time was uh, Chris Jenkins, uh, John Kantriet, uh, Keith Irvin, uh, and then Bill Goodfellow and Guy Gran uh, joined us a bit later. Uh, John Spragan sent us information and documents from Saigon. Um, as, a, as a registered journalist, uh, John was able to utilize the Armed Forces Postal Service uh, and be able to send and receive information, which, quite, which was quite helpful. Uh, Fred Branchman joined us uh, with his uh, project Air War, uh, fo focusing particularly on the, uh, the, the bombing in, in Laos. Um, uh, in 1972, um, a, a metal canister containing hundreds of film clips um, from U.S. military aircraft bombing staff had been napalming over the north and, and Laos was, was delivered to, to our office um, anonymously. Um, in, in, from Washington, uh, we shared this um, canister with CBS, and uh, quickly uh, TV uh, TV news was filled with uh, many of those clips, and indeed they still show up uh, in, in documentaries about Vietnam. 
Uh, now, CBF never returned the clips, but since it was the legally stolen property, uh, we didn't try and make it an issue. Um, now, we, we decided in the summer of 73 to, to set up a second uh, IRC office um, in, in Berkeley, uh, with three, three uh, lodging uh, at the Southeast Asia Center there. Um, we focused on providing current information to the anti-war groups around the country. And we also began more research on North Vietnam. Um, uh, in late 1974, uh, Frank Fitzgerald, Gary Porter, Fred Brafman, and I uh, went to Hanoi for uh, three weeks. Um, and uh, Fitzgerald published a very, very valuable uh, article in the uh, in, in early 75, uh, I started to think about uh, retire, uh, returning to academia um, and later in that year. But um, when I made uh, queries at a number of three or four different universities, they, they, all, they all were negative. Um, basically, Vietnam studies no longer interested them. Um, uh, I was lucky when uh, Christine White, some of you will know her, uh, mailed me a small clipping from the Canberra Times advertising a two-year research position at the uh, Australian National University. Um, um, the Australia Vietnam Society had already been quite active. Um, and, and then following the war, our, our uh, biggest coup was arranging for an, a boatload of water buffalo to Vietnam to start replacing the so many, so many of the buffalo that, that had been uh, lost during the war. So it was a very rewarding experience and it, I have many fond memories. Thank you. My goodness, you really um, had a tremendous impact. And there were also a number of publications, you know, uh, books that, that came out of um, the collaborations that you started uh, through uh, Berkeley and, and the Indochina Resource Center. Uh, right. Quite a... Uh, a contribution to to the field itself, and we're sorry you had to go all the way to Australia. <laughs> well, well, Australia was starting to look to the north at that time, and realizing that they needed people like this. Um, America wanted to forget it at that point. Yes, which brings up a whole other question about reckoning mm -hmm. in the U.S. Well, um, so now we can turn to. Um, uh, Bill Goodfellow, who is also at uh, the Indochina Resource Center for the sort of second half of the story. Yes, I was a, an activist in Boston. I went to Boston University. Howard Zinn was my mentor in grad school, Dr. Cynthia Frederick. And anybody that knows Howard's writing knows that he had very little faith in the elites in Congress. And I, I shared that skepticism. I did meet Fred Brantman at a conference in Paris in, in uh, late 72, and he offered me a job, and I was skeptical. I arrived in Washington in January of 73. I came down for a demo, Nixon's counter inaugural, and Fred did offer me a job. Dan Ellsberg was at the lunch when the offer was made, and all of a sudden, I'm in Washington, and I met uh, I was at the Indochina Resource Center, an activist uniquely unprepared for congressional work, for sure. And I, and I met um, Edward Snyder. Edward Snyder was the executive secretary of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And Ed was a, a Yale Law School graduate. The Friends Committee on National, National Legislation is the, uh, there's, there's Ed, is the lobbying arm of the Quakers. Ed was brilliant patient and a wonderful teacher. And very, very quickly, he organized us. The, the background here is the Christmas bombing of 72 created huge opposition across the United States. And it created opposition in Congress. And all of a sudden, Congress looked like an actor. And then the uh, January uh, Paris Peace Accord, the Peace Accord changed everything really. When and and uh, the Indochina Resource Center, I did not do this. I'm sure David was behind this. Did a an analysis of the of the peace accord. I, Fred and David and Gary. Yeah, Gary Court especially. And uh, but the peace accord was the sort of benchmark for us. The Americans, it, it 
got the Americans out, the last Americans left in, in March of, of, of 73. But the United States continued to pour money into uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And the Thieu government, the South Vietnamese government that we supported, made it really clear that they weren't going to implement the, the terms of, of the agreement. Uh, and Nixon, now initially Johnson, then and Nixon was not very enthused about it either. So, but we started lobbying Congress. We, we said, this is not working. And what we did is we, we through Ed and others, we learned how the whole congressional process and we developed some very, very good sources. Guy Grant and I and Chu and from Normick and, and many others spent hours and hours and hours every week walking the halls of Congress and becoming their real insiders. We provided information to members of Congress who had become very skeptical. There had been a few people like Frank Church and, and Mark Hatfield who was there with, Senate, with uh, Ed Snyder who were against it. But all of a sudden, even weather veins like Hubert Humphrey, who we never trusted and who always sold us out in the end. But nonetheless, we worked very hard moving these folks, providing information. We had, part of it was just information in the media. The media at this point, by, 19, by 1973, the media was doing a pretty good job of reporting what was going on. And my colleague, Christy Macy, edited something or put together something called Indochina Today, which was press clippings from around the world. And we did, we distributed thousands of copies, not only in the Hill, but all around America. So the really good um, press clippings, including from, from Europe. So we flooded Congress with, with information. And the key thing, which, which we did in, jointly with Normic, was we, were, we thought it was very clever. The AID, uh, and, the, and the Pentagon had a three ring binder presenting their program. So we did our little, I lost the three rings, but we did our little program, uh, our analysis, which was a very careful analysis of every single program. We concluded that only about 2% of the money that was going to uh, Indochina in those days was purely humanitarian. Most of it was either supporting the economy, which was totally dependent. They got, I think, 86% of, of Vietnam and, and even more so Cambodia of its support from the United States. And the other issue was uh, the, the, the Saigon government and the US government were not uh, 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 honoring the peace agreement. The peace agreement brought the US troops out. That was the key thing, but it laid out conditions uh, and you could see the Americans were, were undermining this, Chu was undermining this, and we kept going to Congress. We had people like Fred Brantman and others who had been in and out of Vietnam. I hadn't been there at that point, but they were made it very clear that we were losing this war and all this extra aid was doing was keeping, keeping the war going. To the fiscal 75, uh, request was something like $2.5 billion. Billions we thought was real money in those days. It's not so much these days. And there was just simply no hope that this war was going to end and uh, with a, in, a, in a favorable way. And we were pouring money in. The good news is that the American troops were out. So we spent days and days and days on the Hill meeting with members of Congress. And it was, again, Ed Snyder who was the key key person. And the, and the key developments were uh, in March 73, the last US troops withdrew. And then the Cooper Church Amendment in June of 1973 prohibited further US military action because we worried that the US would come back. And then the key thing that, that I worked on, I was not clever enough to learn Vietnamese. I did speak somewhat rudimentary French, good enough to deal with the Cambodians who French was their second language. So I was a Cambodia person and we worked really hard on the Cambodia bombing amendment, which was key. And it, it, I think it passed in June and it didn't take effect until August. And I remember shortly after that, the, uh, uh, the, the administration managed to get a supplemental funding request through. And uh, a colleague and I, Steve Cohen was the, the I think it was called the Coalition to Stop Funding the War. Steve and I were sitting in our office and Ed Snyder came in, bouncing, smiling, and he said, what are you guys depressed about? And we said, well, we, we lost this vote. He said, 
I've been here working on this issue for seven years. And he said, this was the first, the Cambodia bombing amendment was my first real victory. So Ed had, had staying Thanks. power, that's for sure. But um, so it, we, the, the, uh, it was very touch and go. There was clear uh, opposition in Congress. And again, remember that going back to the Tonkin Gulf re resolution, uh, you know, we had Bruning and Morris, only two people opposed to it. And so Congress really came around. I think it was Cambodia, it was the uh, Christmas bombing of Hanoi in 1972 was really key and then signing the peace agreement. So there was a peace agreement, which was key. And then in, in, um, now at, in December of 1974, I left uh, Washington for Vietnam and Cambodia. And the idea was I was going to prepare testimony, get information to, to testify against the, uh, uh, the uh, appropriation to keep the war going. And I was in Cambodia for, for the last two months of the war. And we had a delegation come through, a delegation that sort of dream delegation, Bella Abzug, Millicent Fenwick, and Congressman Pete McCloskey, a very wonderful liberal uh, Republican from, from California. And the, the embassy had, a, a, they were going to take them to refugee camps and so on. And, and I worked with some journalists. We said, we're going to go to the front. And the front in Phnom Penh in those days was about, it's like the Beltway in Washington, about a 20 minute drive. And it really was an eye popper for them. And then I finally was evacuated from Vietnam with a final helicopter evacuation when the Khmer Rouge came in five days later. And then I went back to Saigon and I'd spent earlier in the year, I was in Saigon. And what was very clear, not only were we losing the war, but we weren't, it was what was clear that we were not losing the war because of a lack of am ammunition on our side. Our guys, the, the, the uh, Saigon government had tremendous amounts of, of, of ammunition and they were, Found these positions of the of the uh, FMLN with artillery, sometimes on a 24-hour basis, and then they would stop and they would run forward, and there would be a few shots come out, and they would go back and pound them again. So it was it was clear that that we were losing, and we weren't losing because of, of a lack of ammunition, a lack of money. And then finally, I got evacuated from from uh, Saigon, and I ended up finally back in the United States as an anti-war activist without a war. Uh, mm -hmm. Needless to say, I didn't get to testify against the aid program, which didn't, didn't happen. And that's when I set up the Center for International Policy. Our goal, which a number of us had been in the anti-war movement, our goal was to make sure the lessons of Vietnam were not forgotten. Mm -hmm. and, and I hate to, I hate to say that we have not been terribly successful uh, whether it's Iraq, I mean, it worked for a while until uh, until it was. I think it was Cora Weiss who who coined the the Vietnam syndrome, and then it was it was uh, George Bush the the elder when we went into uh, into uh, uh, it was Operation Desert Storm. Said, so by golly, we finally licked the Vietnam syndrome. Well, we certainly forgot the lessons in in Iraq and Afghanistan and. It, which is really unfortunate. So I can't say that I've been terribly successful, but we were certainly successful in stopping the funding of the Vietnam War, which would have kept it going for, for many, many, many more years had it, had it continued. And we worked really uh, very, very closely with Narmik and, and with Chu, and, and I'll let her pick up from there. Very good, Bill. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, a really good segue to two. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I have to say that NARMIC um, stands for the National Action Research into the Military Industrial Complex. And that term, as many of you know, was popularized by President Eisenhower himself in his farewell address to the American people, where he warned of the total influence economic, political, even spiritual, of this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry that is new to the American experience. That's Eisenhower's warning. Um, and so NARMIC was created by the head of the Peace Education Division of the American Friends Service Committee, um, the legendary Stuart Meacham. Of course, the younger people will not remember Stuart Meacham, but he was a major um, person, not only in the anti-war movement, involved in many national mobilizations and so on, 
but also in the civil rights movement. And, and it was formed in late 1969 in a time of growing opposition to the war in Vietnam. And NARMIC was designed to support peace activists across the country with solid information about what their local universities and industries were doing in support of US intervention in Vietnam. And we um, subscribed to a whole bunch of different things. Uh, one very special publication was a monthly service called the DMS Market Intelligence Report. It was put out by the Pentagon for its military contractors. It was an absolute gold mine. It had almost every military contract, the amount, the contractor, little bit of information about what it was for, was perfect for us because we could analyze where weapons were being made, what they were and who were manufacturing them. And one of the, our earliest publication, this was before my time. So this is, um, but this is what Narmik did um, in 70. The first publication was weapons for counterinsurgency. Um, and Stewart uh, wrote the introduction to weapons for, for counterinsurgency. And he said, there is a tyranny in the process which produces apathy in the face of the worst horrors and most flagrant injustices committed against people who are struggling for self-determination. So in addition to the list of the products and producers in support of the war, you know, thanks to DMS and um, a lot of military publications, um, including Aerospace Daily and so on, we were able to put together uh, this inf a lot of information. And it, we also built on the deep research and analysis of Dr. Eric Prokosh. I don't know if you remember him. He was an anthropologist at the University of Wisconsin, but he, 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 he had a fixation on anti-personal weapons, among other things. And so he, he did a lot of uh, tremendous research on that and about the actual uses of anti-personnel, chemical and biological weapons. And we also depended on Dr. Michael Clare, um, who many of you also know. Um, and, and he wrote about how these weapons supported US troops, um, US foreign policy goals and actions. And um, Eric wrote that it seems valid to conclude that Anti-personal weapons are developed and designed specifically for wars in which people are the targets, not tanks, missiles, or warfare in industries. And that was a very important um, point that needed to be made at that time. And Michael Clare wrote that Vietnam became the showcase for proving that the US, the United States could stop national revolutions in developing countries. So the, a lot was at stake in that. And one chapter, I mean, described how information about manufacturers could be put to use with an account of the Honeywell project. I don't know if you all remember the Honeywell project. You know, again, um, NARMIX research for, for, for activists. I mean, that was a whole point of NARMIC is, 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 is providing information so activists could demonstrate um, and challenge uh, war machines like war industries like Honeywell, um, and uh, and 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 the peace activists took took on Honeywell, which was the largest private in employee in Minnesota at that point, with a lot of tactics, including varieties of public demonstrations, a lawsuit, a Sunday visit to the church of the board chair, and more. And then NARMIC issued um, a second publication the next year, also aimed at local activists on federal funding for university policing studies. Um, and that was police on the home front. I mean, I can go on, but you know, uh, to, to proceed. Um, I, and I joined NARMIC in 1971. And, um, uh, and my research focus was the, U.S. aid to the Thiel regime. And that was a strategic move after the Paris Agreement was signed because U.S. aid was highly vulnerable given an extremely skeptical U.S. Congress. So the, um, so, 
so the research that we did, I mean, it was it was a very long publication, you know, footnoted and everything using many varieties of sources. Um, and, and I think that Congress liked it because it was reprinted in the congressional rep in the US congressional record by Mike, Senator Mike um, Gravel. I mean, I'm not sure how, about how to pronounce his name correctly. Who, well, when he introduced the report into the congressional report, said that there had been a great deal of controversy over whether or not the United States should continue its programs of military and economic aid to the South, South Vietnamese government of Nguyen Van Thieu. And he noted that there was a question of central importance to the peace negotiations in Paris and crucial to US foreign policy. But in spite of its great importance, very few Americans were actually aware of the extent of this aid or the purpose it served. And so, and that our report traced the history of US aid to South Vietnam, as well as the ongoing day-to-day -day programs in that country, which US dollars finance. So he thought it was of interest to members of Congress and their constituents. And we relied on, on, on um, a lot of things, including US Senate um, hearings on say on courts, civil operations and rural development support program, which sounds very um, bland, but in fact, you know, these were like pacification programs, torture programs, um, programs of repression, you know, um, refugee creation programs. And, and so we were able to, 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 to explain this research into ordinary language that people could understand. And, and I think that that was the, the, the important part of what we did. And I think that the A to T, you know, the, the research there made it easy for us to respond quickly as Bill mentioned, showed in his wonderful document. So we had a lot of research already so that when USAID came up with its, its, its um, report, we could just, uh, at, at, the, at, at the actual numbers, but the research is already done. And, and that was important. And we relied also on, on Tai Baoka, if you remember Ngo Vinh Lang, who is also one, I think one of the founders of CCAS as well. We owed a great deal of debt to him because Tai Baoka monitored the Saigon press. And so we were, a, we were able to put all these different things together. And so A to Tio turned out to be a very useful handle. And we also did slideshows, which you all may, may remember, the automated air war, which again linked, sort of um, connected the dots, as they say these days, between the military industry of the weapons and what these weapons did to the people in Vietnam. And we were able to do this also because we had a Quaker program in Vietnam, in Quang Lai, and, and so, th so we were able to show how these weapons were used in Vietnam and what happened, you know, and, 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 and what happened um, it, on, on the ground. Um, so I think I'm running out of time, but in addition to cutting off the, when, when Congress managed to um, reduce aid to Vietnam, the US government was quite desperate and forced the World Bank to, to um, to step in with, with support and I think um, threatened to withhold the IDA replenishment, which is like $1.5 billion, which is a huge amount of money at that time, if the World Bank didn't step into the breach. And fortunately, because of our sources, our contacts in Vietnam, we were able to hear about it. And so we were able to also then stop World Bank aid to Vietnam. So, but well, I'm out of time. And I'll end there. Quite amazing. And when I think uh, of all, you know, what, what small coteries of uh, committed researchers were able to produce. Um, I, I know Martha um, alluded to it a bit, but what was your main, how were your main vehicles of dissemination? How did you get the word out? Today, it's instantaneous. And there, you know, in addition to all the social media, there's Substack, there's pop, podcasts, there's so many ways of reaching many people. Um, what networks did you penetrate to, to get 
get your information out to uh, to activists. Can anyone well, speak to that? I, well, may I start? The peace movement was our vehicle. You know, so the AFSC had offices all over the country. Boston office used a lot of our stuff and other peace movements too. And I think the automated air war and the other slideshows were widely used. And so they knew to come to NARMIC. They, they, they knew to ask, you know, uh, for information on um, war um, military producers, you know, in their area. And, and I think it was the... It, we use the, um, the the communications of the of the inter, you know the national and then international peace movement. Mm -hmm. uh, Beverly, you're muted. Did you want to say something? Okay. Yes. Uh -huh. um, we also had teach-ins, and I know for those of us that were involved in both uh, the Yet Report and Leviathan. We were very active in organizing the actual movement itself. We were people who helped to make the protests happen, working with Dave Dellinger and others to organize. And um, every one of the protests, of course, had a rally. And that rally, you know, it was almost like um, one thing led to another and the anger also rose. There was an emotional response as the war went on, more and more people felt frustrated and angry. And that anger was something that propelled people to continue to spread the word and to continue fighting. Interesting. What about uh, connections to other networks such as uh, um, the churches with clergy and laity concerned and forth? Uh, did you also, uh, some of you tap into those networks? Did anyone have any kind of formal connection with them, or is it just, um, you know, handing handing mimeograph uh, copies to to someone and getting it out that way? David, you're on unmute, please. David, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Oops, you're muted again. <laughs> there you go. Okay, um, I just mentioned Earl and Pat Martin of the Mennonite Central Committee. Um, they uh, they had their own network and they they had worked and lived in Guanghai province. And so when they came back, they had lots of detailed information and a, a very wide uh, reading list of information. Um, I, I had a, a query. Um, if we uh, can we move into discussion now? I don't know. Um, sure. Um, just uh, and it, it picks up on what several of you said. Um, I, I have the feeling that, that after the Paris Peace Accords, um, there was a sort of dropping off in momentum for for some groups at least. Um, and um, it um, I, I sometimes wonder if uh, it hadn't been water for Watergate and uh, Nixon resigning. Uh, whether when the final offensive began in early 75, whether the, the U.S. would have re-intervened uh, in, in, in the war. As a historian, I am always looking at what if questions um, and uh, that, that has always uh, interested me. Uh, if I may add, David, I think the answer is no. There was such opposition uh, on the part of the public and part of Congress the anti-war movement, you're right, things had, had uh, in terms of demonstrations, yes, but there was simply no support in Congress, absolutely no support in Congress. And, and, and uh, our efforts, I think, really did bear fruit and not just knocking on doors, but using the committee system, getting information into the congressional record, and in the media, people like you and Fred Bramfin and others were constantly either quoted or writing op-ed pieces. And I think the, the ultimate pat on the back came from none other than, than Ambassador Graham Martin. After the, <laughs> after the war, uh, he was in a committee and he asked, what happened? And he says, well, we were up against, quote, the most effective propaganda organization the world has ever known. And that was the Indochina Resource Center and Project Air War. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty impressive. I think he overstated. I, I yes. regretted not having that during 
for fundraising during our time at the IRC. <laughs> we could have really done well. By that point, we had closed it down. But so we really did have an impact. Mm -hmm. And and the people running the war felt it. And so I, I think it's by 75, there was simply no way that they were going to reintroduce the, the troops. It just wasn't, there was no public support for it at all. When I met the Vietnamese uh, in 1971, the Viet Cong, the National Liberation Front, they were absolutely thrilled with the movement in the United States. And it was, you know, I was kind of ashamed, you know, as an American, you know, and of course, you know, they said, we don't blame the people, we blame the government. But one of the things that they said was that you must continue to fight. You must continue because if it is not our country, it will be somewhere else. The weapons industry needs to have a place to distribute. And I will never forget that. And every time in Gaza, as, as we send all those horrible, horrible planes and stuff to Israel to use against the people in Palestine, those words come back to me from the North Vietnamese people I spoke to. And um, I, I would love to have, see a movement now. I, I might not, I think we do. I mean, I think there's a great hue and cry now about what is happening to the Palestinian people, but we'll have to see where it goes and what happens. That reminds me that there, thank you, Beverly. There's a, a question uh, from someone in the audience uh, wondering whether there's a, a, a present day equivalent to NARMIC. Does anyone know of any organization that is uh, really focusing on the military industrial complex at this point? Um. I think that what NARMIC did created an awareness so that it, it, even though there's not a NARMIC now, for example, in, 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 in calls for ceasefire in Philadelphia, there was a march um, the other day to, to one of the military um, sites um, that was supplying uh, weapons to, you know, to Israel. And so there is that link that um that has been made and the only other thing that is it seems close but at a much more high-tech level is bellingcat i don't know if, if you guys have heard of bellingcat um they 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 follow uh, um well i think i i'm not sure remembering when they started but i think they but they they use the internet and so on to follow you know you where troops are located in different places. I think that they were active in Bosnia for that. They're now active in Ukraine um, and so on. You know, um, and I think in Gaza too. There's there's been reports of Bellingcat um, being able to report where the, the where the where the strikes were against the um, the aid workers recently. I think Bellingcat played a role in that. And I will add, there are a number of think tanks in Washington. The Center for International Policy, my old think tank, is almost 50 years old, going strong. The Institute for Policy Studies continues to do outstanding work. And there's a number of others in Washington doing this. And of course, FCNL still going strong, doing really good work, and the Quakers generally. So this still is being done. There's no question about it, just not as as uh, high profile as perhaps during the war, but there's a lot of really good, serious research on the whole industrial, uh, we call it the congressional industrial military complex. So it's it's still going on. Also a call out to um, the anti-war veterans who were very prominent after the war and mm -hmm. um, they still are. I mean, those that are around. And um, I think that um, there, there's there's a lot of people who participated in those years who are doing good work in their own individual ways, but some like organizations, the anti-war veterans in particular, have come forward now around the wars that have happened since then after 9-11. And that too is really, really important. Well, there are whole new generations of anti-war Vietnam veterans, you know, the Iraq veterans against the war who are now called about face yes. 
And the Vietnam veterans against the war include certainly in their fundraising, talk about mentoring the next generations of veterans coming behind them and, right. and just giving them support. So yes, I want to, I want to echo that, that shout out, Beverly. Yeah, yeah. I, I had another question for, uh, as a historian, as a general query. And um, I, I often feel that we could have done, uh, done more to foster uh, interaction with foreign, foreign organizations and, and for, foreign anti-war organizations during the, during the war. Um, uh, we, I remember we had good contact with uh, Beihei Ren uh, in Japan um, and, then we, and with several groups in France and Sweden, but I, I, I don't know of anyone who really paid an, enough attention to the third world and uh, to anti-war prospects in, in those countries. I do remember um, being in, I was in, a student in France at the time, and uh, there was a Paris American committee to, to stop the war um, that had, uh, we were able to attend a lot of the uh, events organized by the Vietnam, uh, the Union of Viet Vietnam Students yeah. in France and those kinds of things where Madame Bin would attend. It was, Mm -hmm. In the UK, Peggy yeah. Duff. Some of Pardon? you may remember Peggy Duff. Oh, yes, Peggy Duff, I remember. There. Yes, I met her there. <laughs> there was a lot of, she was sort of the Cora Weiss of the UK and just yeah. did amazing organizing work. So, mm -hmm. but you're right, the, the, the Global South was not a factor here. I mean, they were probably worried that they would be the next targets. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm talking about Peggy Duff. Peggy Duff was very active in the international campaign to shame the World Bank from giving aid to the Saigon regime. And mm -hmm. Peggy Duff coordinated with Richard Falk, Narmik, Gabriel Kolko, um, mm -hmm. Jean-Claude Pomonti, you know, and oh, yes. I think our Swedish friends in the background to, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we even managed to get information on the first Paris um, talk that was close to us. So there, there was a very, there was very strong pressure, um, in the end, to stop the World Bank from giving aid, and that was that was not just Americans, but the the whole international community, um, came out for that. Mm -hmm. And a slightly, you know, sort of a, a more abstract level, the CCIS also published a lot of material related to other parts of Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and other than the Indochina countries, um, Korea. Uh, we're, we're trying, it was not directly, it wasn't practical in the sense that Narmik's work would actually change a vote in Congress and Bill's work would actually change a vote in Congress. But trying to say, what are the same issues about intervention and first world presumptions about what you think a quote third world ought to become and how you're going to make it become that or prevent nationalist revolutions in those countries from taking foot? So we, we, you know, continually were publishing, even in the late 60s when the focus was first of all on the war. But in, it, I mean, I, as I, I had a long list of issues, and I thought nobody's going to listen, want to listen to me just go through a long list of articles that we published. But um, we, we did, you know, again, as I said, it's not action, or they were not action oriented so much as analytically you know, analytical frameworks and often in solidarity with activists or scholars from those countries. Not, you know, not, not outside of Asia, but, but we, so that's something, it's not quite what David is talking about, I think, in the sense of direct hand, you know, armed, arm linked alliance to accomplish a, a goal in the moment, but a more general sense of this is how, this is how you can think about, this is how we do think about, these other universes that you Americans don't know squat about mm -hmm. and really hoping that we Americans would come to know more and be more thoughtful and way more respectful. Like, who are you? What are your aspirations? Mm -hmm. That's what our model of what you're supposed to be. Let's see if there are any other questions. Yeah. Yes. Um... I think uh, 
John answered the fact, well, there's one broader question. Um, and that is, you know, have you any, what is your feeling now, your assessment now of um, Vietnam and what it is or has achieved or um, what it's like today? Mm. I, I'll just, uh, I mean, I try and follow events and things have uh, really uh, developed remarkably just in the last five or 10 years. There was a, a period from 75 to 95, let's say, or 90, where uh, not much uh, was accomplished at all. And I, I might add that you know, trying to get uh, aid to Vietnam after the war um, it was, was a major problem. We tried very hard in Australia and with some success, but um, yeah, but I think that Vietnam is really moving along remarkably. The biggest deficiency now is in is in rural education. Um, the, the the urban children are getting a pretty good schooling, but that's definitely haven't carried through to the cut to the countryside yet. Yeah, I think you you bring up an important point, and that is that yes, the war ended in 1975, but then you had the whole period of the embargo. Mm -hmm. against uh, Vietnam, which which really uh, stifled, you know, so much in terms of the ability for education exchange for uh, Vietnam to get up to date journals, anything. Mm -hmm. It was um, and it's not it's not a period that's very much followed or talked about yeah. anymore. In 1976, the Center for International Policy we started a program to normalize relations with Vietnam. The Christopher Reynolds Foundation gave us the initial mm -hmm. funding mm -hmm. and we took trips, we took delegations. The, Amer the US did not want to, Vietnam, they just totally wanted to forget. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until I think it was 95 when Clinton mm -hmm. uh, yeah. re you know, reestablished, re we had a 19 yeah. year trade embargo and it was John Kerry and John McCain, who gave him political cover, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, seventy five to ninety five, twenty years of you know the same sort of treatment we're still giving Cuba, I might add, mm -hmm. but it was counterproductive for us, and and it was certainly not helpful to the Vietnamese. But it was John Kerry and John McCain, and uh, who really paved the way for that. On the, on the other side, also, I think that, that the embargo and that whole hostility toward, we're not going to let you have a successful, you know, you won, we're not going to let you be successful mm -hmm. kind of choking approach. I think it tended to strengthen the most hardline elements of the governments there and make them least able to be inclusive of the, the people that had just come into this, you know, where this nation state had changed from being two divided hostile ones into one. Um, I was, you know, what I, what I, as you know, some of you know, after when David and his, his fellow Indochina Resource Center, true experts decided they needed to live some kind of a life. <laughs> I was one of those who was recruited to keep the Berkeley office of the Indochina Resource Center, later Southeast Asia Resource Center going also with Christopher Reynolds funding. Mm -hmm. I was not a expert, I don't speak Vietnamese, but I had the privilege of being selected by of, to be part of a four person group funded by Cora Weiss um, in 1977. It was the second group of Americans to visit Vietnam. And we were there, it was a friendship trip. You know, we were escorted every step of the way, but included in our four people were Ron Reidenauer, who was the GI who had tipped <laughs> off the you know up upset you know upper le levels about what happened at Milai. He was not himself there, but he heard about it, and he passed it on and insisted you know demanded that people pay attention. And Don Luce, who mm -hmm. you are familiar with, mm -hmm. so <clears throat> we on our trip. I mean, some of the highlights were in Saigon. We we went to meet with some of the people that Don Luce had known, and those who got the invitation had bicycled all over the city to get. There are other friends who knew Don Luce to come, and there was this huge meeting of people that just loved each other. It was, it was unbelievably moving. I mean, I was a spectator to that. I was there. 
I was part, you know, I'm part of the effort. I'm a, I'm a fellow traveler, but I wasn't one of those who was ever there and knew them and, you know, visited the prisons where they were incarcerated and those things. So in that time, I mean, we, we went to Mulai, what, at that point, 1977, it was nine years after what actually happened there. But it was still, it was still a very raw experience. We sat across the table from two women who had survived the massacre and whose family members had been killed. And the young cadre who was the official explainer was herself said she had been a young teen, had gone to the market. And when she came back, her family was dead. Uh, she was not friendly to us. I mean, she was dignified. She was polite, but it was very clear that we were Americans and she was a Vietnamese victim of American aggression. Um, and, you know, so anyway, that that period, that was during the embargo, we were carrying money to build a hospital near the Mila, site of the My Lai uh, massacre. And something actually got built there, some kind of a medical clinic. I don't think it was the full hospital that um, was originally envisioned. But it was, that was still a time when the visas we had to go to Vietnam were given to us in loose sleep form we could fold up and put in our passports. So they were never stamped that we had visited Vietnam, which was in our, <laughs> listed in our passport as a country where those passports are not valid anymore. I wanna interrupt for a minute in yeah. terms of where we are on time and allow for some of the questions that were posted. But I also wanna say that if you look back we'll on our blog but we'll post a link to it we did vpcc did a whole program on the post-war normalization from 75 to 95 which you find interesting there also was a program done uh of people who were in saigon at the day the war ended and in hanoi the day the war ended and that's april 30th then coming in a couple of weeks that you might want to look at um, also, Don Luce's name has been mentioned. There is a program in preparation that will look at the whole work of the Mobile Education Project and other and the uh, American NGOs and religious organizations that worked both sides of the line, as it were, had connections in the North and with the Liberation Front, and did a lot of educational work in the U.S. So. Uh, did humanitarian work in the South and educational work. So you'll get notices about these things. But I wanted particularly um, to point to the questions that Anwin has raised. Um, and uh, Do or David in particular might be able to answer them. Uh, she writes, um, you described some of the sources that you consulted in writing your reports, which was very helpful. My question is, did you and to what extent rely on sources provided by Vietnamese people or groups in South Vietnam besides Toi Bao Ga? Who were, who were some of those people and or groups? Do or David, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Um... I mentioned uh, John Spragans uh, being there for several years, and um, that was one of his main purposes was to find information among these diverse groups um, and uh, and manage to get it through the Postal Service. Um, so, yeah, there was a, a definite um, effort. It, um, you know, the uh, groups, they, they faced a lot of, a lot of arrests and uh, imprisonments. Um, so it was a a moving target <laughs> to accomplish all of this, but there was, I don't know about other organizations or whether they did, did, did the same thing or not. Well, I mean, we met, I mentioned that the AFSC had the program in Guangai. So we relied on the reports of Quaker staff who spoke extensively to the Vietnamese in Guangai, you know, who, I mean, of course in the reports had to be anonymous, but their reports were based on the Vietnamese living in Quang Ai, among other um, places. Mm -hmm. the and other... actually, the, the, the U.S. military um, did a great job because um, besides Thuy Ga, they monitored the Saigon press. So mm -hmm. 
And our people managed to get, you know, I guess they they monitored it and they wrote it up. So there was a daily briefing um, summary of the Saigon press. So that's actually how we first learned that 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 the U.S. was working on the World Bank to give aid to Vietnam was was thanks to the U.S. military's monitoring of the Saigon press okay. because they didn't want us to know in the U.S. but Tia wanted Vietnamese in Vietnam to know you know that help is on the way. You may remember the Foreign Broadcast Information Service (FIBIS). Yeah which uh, translated just yeah. an incredible amount of, of information. And we, we poured over that. And uh, it was, I, I can't remember. We did too in the post-war the CIA that put it out, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the CIA. The other AFSC role was carried out by Sophie and Paul Quinn Judge mm -hmm. in Saigon, who had very close relations with the third force people. And we will again, there will be a VPCC program about the role of the third force, right? There's, it's not focused, so you have to hold it back. It's not focused on your camera. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Finally, I wanna suggest we end with Anwin's second question, um, which brings us, sort of reminds us that it's never over <laughs> as long as, <laughs> Uh, there are people alive like us on the one side and people on the other side. Um, the, her last question is, over the past two decades, there has been a new wave of Vietnam-centric revisionist histories represented by work such as Hanoi's War that blames most of the wartime violence and aggression, as well as the failure of the Paris peace agreements on Hanoi. In other words, it was Hanoi rather than Saigon and the US that first violated the peace agreements and was determined to win by force. Based on the research you did, especially on the 73 to 75 period, do you think there is veracity to those claims? Again, David, but anybody well, else? Maybe some, somebody else pick up on that. <laughs> well, all you have to do is read the accords and exactly. it's pretty clear how I mean, the accords very much favored the the uh, um, Vietnamese. I mean, as opposed to the, I mean, it got the Americans out, but it it followed the the uh, uh, earlier '69 um, uh, uh, agreements, and the, the bombing produced absolutely nothing. And so the accords were very favorable to the to the uh, well, the North and the Liberation Forces, and they had no reason to violate it. It was the U.S. and the uh, Saigon forces that. Um, felt they were being undermined. And I, I guess in a sense they were. I mean, Chu himself only sent his foreign minister to sign it. So he was not very enthusiastic and I don't think he ever intended to, to uh, implement it. I, also, I would say that the revisionist history um, ignored all the press reports, all the contemporary press reports at the time that, that, that described overwhelmingly that it was a Tio side that violated the peace agreement. You know, you had to ignore that to, to make the claims that they did. I also think on a psychosocial level, the US found it and continues to find it very hard to believe they were defeated. <laughs> and I think that that has really sort of over a net over the truth continues in that sense. We've had a lot of a lot of time to get used to losing wars. I think since World War II, I think Grenada is the only one we actually won. But uh... Panama, never forget Panama. <laughs> I want to yeah. I want to end with a note about the future. A year from April thirtieth is the fiftieth anniversary mm -hmm. of the end of the war. We are talking in VPCC about and welcome everybody who's watching this now or watches the YouTube video to contribute to discussion about how we ought to recognize that 50th anniversary. There will be a lot of things happening in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos. Laos was not a, was a different time frame, but Vietnam and Cambodia are both April 75. <laughs> um, if there's interest, we will be organizing a trip for people to go 
to observe the way that anniversary is recognized, which is particularly complicated now because the US and Vietnam are strategic partners. We have a comprehensive strategic partnership and we've essentially jumped back to 1945 in terms of China as the major threat that unites us. So uh, it's a fascinating place to visit. It's incredibly developed, especially if you saw it in the first 20 years after the end of the war. Um, and so we hope people either go on their own or consider going with us. Um, it's uh, This has been an excellent, excellent program. Thank you, Linda, for holding it all together. And thank you, everybody, for your participation. As I said, this, this will go, if I get it up on YouTube tonight, I'll send a note out in the course of the day tomorrow with the link. We had actually a couple hundred people register, but only had about 65 at the peak on numbers because a lot of people will register to get that notice to watch it later that in times that are more convenient. Thank you, David, for getting up early. David is in <laughs> Australia. Uh, so for him, it's the big, it's fall, not spring. And mm -hmm. the hours are not quite 12 hours different, but substantially. Thank you, John, for putting it together and all the work. I'm saying goodbye. I have to leave. Us also. Bye and now. Let me just finally say while you're here, Carol Brightman, who yes. you mentioned at the beginning. Yes. Carol went back with us to Vietnam with a group of former OSS people. Yes, she, she worked went a few with, times. Yeah. Who had worked with Ho Chi Minh and Ziap. Right. Uh, and she was a very important participant in that. So I also wanted to, to mention that. So the loss of a brilliant mind. Yes. Mm. Any last words, Linda? Anybody else? Do you? Mm. No, just a big thank you for for getting us all together, and I hope that this will um, spark some conversations about um, how we deal with reckoning with the war in Vietnam and what needs to be thought about for the future, thank and you. and how we apply those lessons to the current wars in the current uh, era. Yeah, I was going to say, as a, uh, as a historian, I, I look at what's happening in in uh, in several different places in America, in, in the world now, and, and wonder whether people really learn anything over time or not. We can't be... No, the, lessons, the lessons don't <laughs> last. The they don't. No, pessimism doesn't lead to activism. So we need to be hopeful. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Beverly. That's, that's why. Okay. That is I... Well, I I put the link to the Pete Seeger video on the blog page um, and we'll probably wind up putting some more resources there too. So, uh, and we'll put, of course, we'll put the link to the video on that blog page. So, so that's the place to point people who you're introducing to this whole program because they'll get the bios and other things. So goodbye, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, it was wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful Thank you. to see old friends. And we didn't get screwed by the internet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you. you all. Did great well, John. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.